Welcome back. Um, this lecture, we're going to look at the 1920s, which is often referred to as the prosperity decade because of the great economic growth, which until the depression started in 1929, improved the standard of living of most, but not all Americans. Because of the length of this lecture, it's divided into two parts, and this is the first part. Think for a minute of your image of the 1920s. When I ask that question in class with students, the first thing people say is jazz, or the flappers, the girls, young ladies with short dresses for the first time, short hair, smoking cigarettes, or others will say the gangsters, in Chicago, such as Al Capone and others. <clears throat> the decade of the 1920s, the United States is often referred to as the Roaring Twenties. The economy in general was roaring. There were many, many new cars. You had the new jazz music. Uh, so it was a very, very dynamic time. But well, as we'll see in this lecture, that was largely restricted to certain segments of the population in the major cities. This is the image of the 1920s for most people at first thought. A flapper girl, we'll talk more about the flappers later. You can see at the time considered a shockingly short dress, a very close fitting, close uh, bobbed hair, short hair, close to her head, and smoking a cigarette in a long cigarette holder. <clears throat> now this is the cover of Life magazine, which was, along with Time magazine, probably the two most important weekly magazines in the United States until the 1880s, excuse me, 1980s or 1990s. This magazine was put out in 1926, and this was the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. So you can, if you squint, you can see the date, uh, July 1st, 1926. So it was that week. Um, you also notice the price, it was only 15 cents. And the title of the cover in the lower left says, The Spirit of 26, The Spirit of 1926. And it really is the image in large cities among the younger people of the 1920s. You have the flapper girl with a short close fitting dress, short hair, uh, dancing fairly wildly, playing a musical instrument. I believe that's a ukulele. You have the musicians in the back playing saxophones and, and drums. Now, the caption under the flapper lady's uh, foot says 1776 to 1926, 143 years of liberty, referring to the Declaration of Independence, and seven years of prohibition. <clears throat> so this is, um, slide is just what I told you about the cover of that magazine. The 1920s were really the new era of massive consumption by the middle class and, of course, the wealthy. Overall, a very, very prosperous decade with low unemployment and rising incomes, certainly for most white people, uh, not for all blacks uh, nor other minorities. By 1929, the United States had the highest standard of living in the world. And the economy of the United States was really dominated over this decade by an explosion in the manufacture and selling of new consumer goods. The radio, cars, all sorts of electrical gadgets for the home. And this was made possible by the new invention of consumer debt. Traditionally, people went and paid in cash. 
perhaps the local grocer would let you um, buy your groceries and pay the following week. But now stores came up with uh, installment plans where you could buy, for instance, a new electric um, washing machine and pay a certain amount per month over a year or 18 months. They didn't have credit cards yet. That's a phenomenon that took place much later. So you had huge increase in consumer debt. Everybody assumed their income was going to increase. So why not acquire debt? You can buy the things now that you want to enjoy and you can pay back over a period of a year or two. Also, there was a significantly more advertising. You had advertising in magazines such as Life magazine we just saw, other magazines, newspapers, and the new phenomenon of the radio, which we'll talk about in a minute. By the end of the decade, most American homes had radios, and the radio stations were private, and they were funded by selling advertisements, as is now the case for uh, most radio stations except the public broadcasting system in the U.S. <clears throat> and most of the ads targeted women. These were ads for products they could buy for the home because the average middle class or wealthy woman um, was a homemaker, was not out working. And this is just one example I pulled from the internet um, from Westinghouse, which made all sorts of electrical appliances. And you can see there an electric heater, um, electric toasters, electric waffle irons, electric uh, coffee pots, and electric iron. And we take these all for granted today, but these were really labor-saving devices for a woman who genuinely, generally, unless the family was extremely wealthy, did not have any outside uh, help. This is just an ad for a cereal post toasties with a cute little girl saying, me want a bowl full. And these ads, again, were designed to appeal to women. <clears throat> they had a tremendous increase in electricity in homes throughout the U.S. In 1920, only 35% of homes, about a third of homes, had electricity. Ten years later, over two-thirds of the homes, 68%, had electricity. And this was certainly true in the cities and the larger towns. However, many farms continued, isolated farms particularly, not to have electricity until the 1930s or even the late 1940s after uh, World War II. And that was the case in Texas also. There was very rapid uh, electrification of the cities, uh, the lar then larger towns, but isolated farms, you know, up in the Texas Panhandle or in the middle of West Texas, um, might have had to wait till the after World War II to get electricity. <clears throat> For the first time, you have a mass culture of consumption, and this was brought about by advertising, particularly over national media such as the radio or uh, magazines. And now you have national stores, which are part of chains. Walgreens, uh, which still exists. Many, many stores were set up nationally. And these stores could discount the prices to the consumer because they would buy massive amounts of products and could pass on uh, many of those savings to the consumers. And as I mentioned, you had massive advertising, particularly by chain stores or manufacturers in magazines, radio, and also the movies. People, most people were going to the movies. They obviously didn't have television then. And unless you lived on an isolated farm, uh, you could easily go to the movies several times a week. And before the movies, they would have newsreels and then they will also have advertisements and the same thing during intermission. And um, so people would, would see many advertisements um, in the movie theaters. <clears throat> and I can't overemphasize how much the adoption of the radio changed everyday life in the United States, including, of course, Texas. At first, the radio stations were local. 
And then by the middle of the 1920s, they had national networks uh, such as NBC, um, etc. And they had live music, they brought, had news, and they had many, many advertisements. And there were many comedy shows, um, you know, light shows. In addition to music and news, there were baseball games, uh, broadcast football games. Now we start to have presidential addresses. When we look at the 1930s, we'll see um, President uh, Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, started having weekly chats with the American people uh, via radio. And there were also many serious programs about um, when people wanted to learn at home, they could hear programs on English literature or history or whatnot. And this national network of radio started to break down the strong regional accents in the United States. And it also helped create more of a sense of national unity. Here we have an upper middle class uh, woman. You can see she's certainly dressed as a flapper, even though she doesn't have a short dress on. She has her hair cut short, and that's called the bobbed. And you can see her radio there. This was the latest um, top of the line expensive radio. And the what looks like a horn was actually the speaker at the time. <clears throat> Here we have a more average middle class family. And you can see they're all sitting around um, as the sun tunes in the radio station. And um, again, this was this is actually the first time in history people could listen to music without having um, someone play music in front of them. What a, what a tremendous change. And if you ever go in tours of old homes uh, of wealthy people, you'll see that prior to this period of time, the older homes had separate music rooms where large rooms where people would sit in chairs and, um, you know, seven or eight musicians would come and play music. Now, anybody could have music in their in their home. And this is a poorer family, um, either urban or this family um, is on a farm and you can see them sitting around and listening to the radio. Can you imagine the change in their life, uh, particularly in the northern states where in the winter months it was dark at 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon, bitterly cold so they could, these people could be near the kitchen where there was some warmth and they could li listen to all sorts of broadcasts. There were also many, many religious broadcasts. There, um, there were uh, several very famous uh, Protestant ministers who um, had daily programs on the radio. And now this farm family may not have had electricity. And if they didn't, you might wonder how they used their radios. I mean, these were not transistor radios. They used vacuum tubes, which consumed a fair amount of um, power. So they used car batteries, and they had several car batteries near the radio. And once a week, a truck would come by with a generator and charge up the people's car batteries, which were only used for the radio, and that was for only a few hours a day. So they could listen to the radio all week. <clears throat> this is just what I said. And you could even listen uh, to Betty Crocker. I believe Betty Crocker still makes uh, cake mixes. I've seen them in the local supermarket. And Betty Crocker herself was on the radio telling the housewives um, how to cook and, you know, uh, tips on baking. And then the 1920s is also well known for became a real culture around the car. The number of cars owned by Americans skyrocketed from eight to 23 million over the decade. And it was much easier and less expensive to buy gasoline because there were ma major oil fields discovered in Texas. Uh, we've already talked about spindle top and uh, more oil was found in Oklahoma, Wyoming, and California.
And by the end of the 1920s, the U.S. produced 70% of the world's petroleum, an incredible amount of the world petroleum at that point. And Henry Ford, as you probably know, um, produced his cars in factories using mass production, including the assembly line, which he didn't invent. It was used by some other industries first, but he put it to good use. That brought down the prices of the cars. He also paid the highest wages of any manufacturing company. And he was the first to raise the, significantly the wages of the workers because he said, how can we expect to sell cars and other products if the workers don't make enough to buy anything? Uh, these are cars literally rolling off. This is the assembly line. And you can see at the top, the men have like the seat, all the seats already assembled. And as the car comes rolling along down below, they put the seats in, tighten a few bolts, and the car is almost ready to go. You can see these cars still have the engine. You can still see the engine. They need to put the hood on there. This is inside the factory. Um, the car is um, rolling along an assembly line, and you have workers on both sides. And each man has one or two specific jobs they do. You know, the people that we're looking at in the center foreground of the of the uh, photograph are, for instance, putting the the wheels on and tightening them and, and you know, making some adjustments. <clears throat> well, in terms of culture, music became so important. And this is called the Jazz Age. Again, many people in the 1920s, they think of jazz. And this is a really dynamic music, I'm sure you've heard it, of several musical traditions. And today, if you ask people outside the U.S., what is the quintessential or the iconic American music? People will say either jazz or rock and roll. Um, but most people, I think, would say jazz because there was rock and roll also in uh, Britain. And it originated uh, in the black areas, in New Orleans, Memphis, Tennessee, St. Louis, and Kansas City. And then it spread quickly to the black areas of New York City, such as Harlem and Chicago. And what was really very unique at this time, a time, of, remember, of racial segregation, not just in Texas and the South, but throughout the United States, that wealthy whites would travel to the black areas of the city to go to black nightclubs um, to listen to, to the jazz and dance. Uh, this is an example of one jazz group. This is uh, Benny Goodman's group. Benny Goodman is in the back there. He's white, but most of the performers are black. <clears throat> and this is famed Louis Armstrong. <coughs> Sorry, uh, one of my personal favorites. And what is so sad, Louis Armstrong would travel around the country. People would buy tickets weeks in advance to listen to him. And he would play, um, he had his trumpet and he would sing and he was in, um, you know, the best hotels in town. But he was not allowed to spend the night in those hotels because they were racially segregated. This was throughout the United States, not just the South. And nor was he allowed um, to eat in the restaurants. I already mentioned flappers, and these were a relatively small younger number of young women who really challenged the cultural norms. And they, you know, for that, they wore short dresses, they bobbed their hair, they had it short and like next to their head. Uh, they drank openly, they smoked openly, and they openly discussed sex. And again, this is a small number of young women. Uh, almost exclusively in major cities. Uh, this is the photo of one that we saw at the opening of this, uh, this lecture. And you can see uh, the long cigarette holder, uh, the feather in her hair. I mean, as we'll talk about in the second part of this lecture, most Americans, not just in the South, but throughout the U.S., uh, particularly older Americans, were actually shocked and scandalized by this. And here we have two other uh, flapper women, and you can see their uh, 
walking on the ledge of a skyscraper in New York. I don't know back then if they had Photoshop or something, or if these women actually did that. It's just terrifying to even look at them there uh, <laughs> in high heels, balancing on one leg, uh, and probably dancing at the same time. Uh, but this sort of scandalous behavior, I mean, many, many Americans would say, no, these women should be homemakers, they should be at home, they should have children, they should be taking care of their husband. By the way, they were called flappers because with the modern dances, like the Charleston dance, they would flap their arms around. And so people said they, critics of them said, oh, they flap like children, like chickens rather. They, they're like chickens, they flap their arms instead of wings. And so they were called the flappers. Uh, it was a derogatory description at first, but then they loved it and kept calling themselves flappers. And in the module, there's a two or three minute video um, of just some people uh, dancing the Charleston. You can watch that for a minute or two and it gets you into the spirit here of the 1920s. Okay, we will continue um, the discussion in part two of this lecture. Thank you.